Welcome to Highway Christian Fellowship. I'm Pastor Ralph, one of the pastors here, and it's my joy to welcome you to our service today. We're just simply a family of spirit-filled followers of Jesus who are on a journey of loving God, loving others, and seeking ways to serve our world. And we invite you to join us on this journey. We trust that today's message will be an encouragement to you in your walk of faith. And if you have questions or would like to know more, you can connect with us at hcfsydney.ca. And a pastor would be privileged to speak with you and share with you how you can know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and to make a difference in our world. God bless, and let's enjoy the service today. Ephesians 2.10 says we are God's masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, I don't see a masterpiece, but I want to. So I go to God and I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, would you do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of your Son? Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi. Oh, who are you? I'm God, you said the prayer, so here I am. That's how it works. <laughs> you're not God. No, I am. Okay, uh, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15, 9 say? Lamentations is a very short book. It only has five chapters. Why is it so short? I was tired of lamenting. You are God. What, what's that about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. This is the process. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Let's get busy. Okay. I'm going to bring up things in your life that don't belong in your life. And, uh... Start right here. Your anger. Ow! I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrongest of ways. You compare yourself to others instead of me, and you lie. You tell little white lies. You're so afraid of confrontation. You're becoming a people pleaser. Okay, time out. Um, I think you've done some really good work, and I'm looking pretty good right now. When you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, but when I look like Jesus, people get uncomfortable and I don't think I'm supposed to do that. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. No, what I'm saying is you've grown me to here. Maybe we take a break from each other for a while, all right? And then I'll stay here and then you come back and we can grow some more. You never just take a break from me. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but you never just plateau. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things in your life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, chisel. No, 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 chisel. All right, here we go. Can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Okay, sorry. Mm. This right here, that secret sin, that thing that you run to whenever you're hurting, you're angry, you're lonely, you're tired. Do you want to keep rearranging this in your life or do you want me to chisel it out? Chisel it. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's your whole life. Oh, this, this hurts, okay? I don't think you understand this pain. Don't talk to me about pain. I know all about pain. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you are doing in your life that are insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. I know, but I've let you down so many times, God. No. You were never holding me up. Okay, then chisel away. But just be prepared for what you're gonna find in there. Cause I know who's inside there. God, I get up every morning and I hate what I see in the mirror cause inside is this scared, stupid kid. And I try, I try, but I can't, I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I wanna be, much less who you created me to be. So chisel away and just know what you're gonna find in there. You have listened to so many voices, so many critics for far too long that are not for me. And you've bought into the lie. You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night, at the end of the day, you think you're junk. I don't take time to make junk. I wanna show you something about my love. Reach in your back pocket. This is a, it's a page from a notebook when I was in college. How'd you get this? Hello? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, read it. Dear God, did I hear you right? You said you wanted to use me. But I feel really useless. 
But if you can take this life, this mess of a life I have, and do with it what you want, I love you, God. I love you too. And I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. It's gonna be tough. Yes, but you bought into the lie thinking everything was gonna be easy when you said yes to me. There will be trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy is God's? No, not the way you see yourself or you try so desperately for others to see you. But maybe for the first time in your life, the way I made you, the way I created you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. You are an original masterpiece. Happy Father's Day, men. So glad I could join you today as we celebrate us. Can I ask you a question? When you were a little boy, who was your superhero? Growing up, my number one hero was Superman. After all, he could leap tall buildings at a single bound. He ran faster than a speeding bullet. He was able to lift uh, uh, locomotives with his bare hands. He was the man of steel. And although from another planet, he stood for justice and the American way. Yes, he was definitely my superhero. That was until I climbed a roof, tied a red cape around my neck, and discovered that the law of gravity was stronger than my red cape. Who was your superhero growing up? Over time, my heroes changed and eventually became Batman. I mean, come on. Who could be cooler than Batman? Suave, mysterious. He had a scientific mind that could build the coolest tools and weapons. And let's face it, what's cooler than a bat cave filled with the most awesome weapons, cars, and computers that technology didn't even think about in the 60s and 70s. More than that, like me, Batman was a loner, so he really appealed to me at the time. Now, as I grew older, my heroes changed and adapted with the stage of life I found myself in. Who was your hero growing up? John Wayne? Indiana Jones? Maybe it was James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Who was it that you wished you could be like? We've all had heroes growing up and we've all looked up to our heroes. We all wanted to emulate them, but as I grew up, I realized there were two problems with my heroes. Number one, none of my heroes were perfect. Every hero had an Achilles heel that could defeat them. For instance, Superman had his kryptonite. Batman's weakness was Catwoman. For Indiana Jones, it was snakes. And for James Bond, well... It was his ego that eventually did him in. Not only were my heroes perfect, but none of them were real. I came to realize that I could never become my heroes because they were setting a standard so high and so impossible, I could never follow them. The result was failure, disappointment, disillusionment, and even depression. I know as I'm speaking, I'm not alone in being disillusioned with my heroes. Who was your hero growing up? As men, we struggle with this ongoing pressure to be just like our heroes. Maybe your hero was your dad. And you grew up always trying to please him, but always falling short of what 
you felt his expectations were for you. Maybe it was a, a coach in high school who you wanted to please so much and, and be noticed by, but you always still remained on the bench because you missed the mark. Maybe you just wanted to be like, well, you fill in the blank. The harder we try, the harder we strive, the further we we fall away from the ideal that we want to become. And it's frustrating. It's discouraging. We become disillusioned. And even as Christians, we, we all want to be godly men, don't we? We want to be godly husbands, godly fathers, godly grandfathers, godly brothers, godly uncles. We want to be what we believe God has called us to be, men, men of God. But let's be honest, it's hard. We get discouraged because we try so hard to meet God's unreachable expectations. We end up on our faces in humiliation. In my ministry, I have counseled more than a few men who have grown so disillusioned and discouraged because they've tried and tried and tried to live up what they think thought was the perfect man. They become discouraged and they simply wanted to give up, give up on life, give up on their marriages and give up on God. Guys, I have some good news for you. Today, if you've been striving hard to be that perfect man of God, that perfect husband, that perfect godly dad, just stop. Stop it. You can't. I can't. In fact, God says we can't either. The struggle we have is we strive so hard to fulfill the high expectations we have for ourselves and others place upon us, we end up not knowing who we really are and what God has truly called and designed us to be. So, what am I? Who am I? Who and what are you? And how does that impact my life? Well, let me give you the short answer today. Men, you are a masterpiece. Say that with me. I am a masterpiece. How does that impact your life? Well, it simply means you need to live like a masterpiece. Or to put it another way. You are God's masterpiece. Live like it. In Ephesians 2 verse 10, the Apostle Paul makes it very plain and clear for us. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the thing, good things he planned for us long ago. Say it with me again. I am am a masterpiece. The word that Paul uses is poema. Literally, it translates a poem. Now, I know a lot of guys, poetry isn't their thing, but another way it's translated is workmanship, or as the New Living Translation says, masterpiece. Let me ask you, when it comes to works of art, what comes to your mind that you would consider a masterpiece. What is a masterpiece in your mind? Maybe it's Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, or perhaps A Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. (laughs) Then there's the sculpture, The Thinker by Rodin. The creation of Adam on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo would definitely fall into the category of masterpieces. What is God's greatest masterpiece? Is it what I see each day when I look out at Mount Baker on a sunny day from the pier of of Sydney? Or how about the Grand Canyon? That could definitely be described as a masterpiece, and it's on my bucket list to eventually visit. Or... Maybe it's Niagara Falls and the thundering water that pours over day after day after day. 
What is a masterpiece? The psalmist tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. A few weeks ago, Sue and I sat in awe of God's creation as on our deck we witnessed the colors of the northern lights dance across the night sky. (laughs) Nothing man-made in this earth or beyond could compete with such a display of God's glory. So is that God's ultimate masterpiece? The psalmist reveals that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Our bodies could really be described as a masterpiece. They're intricately designed. My uh, my body contains about 75 trillion cells. Each of those cells are made up of 50 billion atoms. Every four to five seconds, 50,000 of my cells die and are replaced by 50,000 new cells. So while you're listening to this message today, did you know that your body is going to produce somewhere between 15 and 25 million new cells? Furthermore, there are 75,000 miles of arteries, veins, and capillaries in my body. Did that's enough to circle the earth three times? Surely, the human body must be God's masterpiece. God's creation, the heavens, and our human bodies all reveal the glory of God. But, hear this. None of it is truly God's masterpiece. God says, you are greater than all of that. You are his masterpiece. You, yes, you, say it with me. I am God's masterpiece. Now, what does this mean for you and me? Well, to begin with, each masterpiece is completely the work of its creator. None of the artworks and art masterpieces that we previously mentioned popped up out of nowhere. They did not create themselves, nor did they participate in its own creation in any way. It is the artist that does all the work from the formulation of the concept to the planning and to the actual creation of the work of art. The same thing is true when God creates his masterpieces. It's God who chose us before the creation of the world to be his masterpiece. Wow, isn't that incredible? Isn't that awesome how much God loves you? It is God who created the plan to redeem us and to make us his masterpieces, his sons, through his son. And it is God who has done all the work necessary to make us into his masterpiece. Say it with me again. I am God's masterpiece. Notice this sentence begins with the word his. Now, since in the Greek, words in a sentence can be in almost any order, placing the word his at the beginning of of the sentence, well, we could give it this added emphasis. Think about this. Literally, we could translate the first phrase of this verse like this. His, God's masterpiece, we are. Say it with me. I am God's masterpiece. Notice that when Paul writes that we were created in Christ Jesus, he uses a verb that means to create something brand new, something that has never existed before. In other words, when God makes us his masterpieces, he doesn't just change us, he makes us, into something completely new and different. He doesn't just remodel or restore some existing work. No, he creates us a completely new 
masterpiece. I think that's what Jesus meant when he told Nicodemus that one night that he must be born again. And the Apostle Paul makes this point even more directly in his second letter to the Corinthian church. And he says this, and listen to it carefully. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Say it with me. I am God's masterpiece. Secondly, The creation of a masterpiece is a process. (laughs) The creation of a masterpiece does not happen overnight. It's usually, it's not the result of a haphazard effort. For instance, the Mona Lisa, did you know required four years for da Vinci to complete? In fact, x-rays have shown that there are actually three previous paintings underneath the one that we are so familiar with. Masterpieces take time. In fact, we're told Michelangelo took four years to paint the scenes on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Rodin made his first plaster cast of the thinker in 1880. But did you know it wasn't until 1902 that he completed the large scale bronze cast? In the same way, we don't become a finished work of art all at once. Paul says that we were created, that's past tense, but we are present tense, God's masterpiece. Now, by now, you probably recognize that the present tense in the Greek indicates a continuing action. And what this simply means, guys, is literally we are and we will continue to become God's masterpiece. All of us are painfully aware we don't immediately become everything that God intends for us to be the very moment that we accept Christ. No, and I'm so glad for that. I'm glad that he tenderly, lovingly, painstakingly, patiently takes the time to mold me into his image. And it takes time. Yes, sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes we, oftentimes we get impatient, but he molds us and he makes us into what he wants us to be. Just like a skillful artist, God sometimes completes us with a master stroke of his brush. And at other times, he chisels chisels, chisels us away at our lives to get rid of those things that would detract us from our beauty. Say it with me again. I am God's masterpiece. Paul also writes about the process in one of his other letters. He writes, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. It takes time. You are God's masterpiece. And thirdly, all of God's masterpieces are created in Christ Jesus. Now, over the years, artists have used all kinds of media and material to create their masterpieces. For instance, the Mona Lisa was painted on poplar wood. One of Michelangelo's assistants had to develop a special kind of mold-resistant plaster for the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And this became the base for Michelangelo's incredible paintings and work. When Rodin made the 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 cast for the thinker, it originated from cast bronze. But when it comes to God's masterpiece, God only uses one means of creating that masterpiece, his son, the Lord Jesus. 
We've already seen how many times Paul has used the phrases in the book of Ephesians, in Christ, in Jesus. So far as you read Ephesians, it's no accident. Because Paul wants to leave no doubt in our minds exactly who or what comprises God's masterpiece. As magnificent as Mount Baker, the Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls, the Northern Lights, and the rest of all his creation may be, they are not God's masterpieces. As awesome and immense as the heavens are, they're not God's ultimate masterpiece. Even as intricately and wonderfully made as the human body is. <laughs> Even that, not God's masterpiece. God's masterpieces are those people who have accepted the gift of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And those who have been created anew through this means, the means of his death and his resurrection. Listen, you are God's masterpiece. Say it with me. I am God's masterpiece in Christ Jesus. But Paul just doesn't stop recording for us the purpose for what, by which we become God's masterpiece. He goes on to describe the purpose of God's masterpiece. God has a purpose for you and I. It's not just to sit and collect dust in some museum. It's not to be critiqued by those so-called professionals. No, we have a purpose. When the Mona Lisa was commissioned, it was commissioned as a gift by da Vinci's father for some friends, Michelangelo. He painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel to fulfill a commission from Pope Julius II. Rodin created the thinker as a part of a commission to create the entrance to the Louvre in Paris. Although we can find biblical support for a number of the different uh, purposes for God, for which God has created us as his masterpiece. Paul focuses on one particular purpose in this verse. It's the verse that we translate to do. In the NIV, it's to do in the NASB, it's for. The KJV says unto. And those are probably the most accurate translations. The actual Greek word is a three letter preposition which is used to indicate purpose or reason. So, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, Paul is indicating here that when God creates his masterpieces, his purpose is this, to do good works. Even though Paul has already made it absolutely clear that there are absolutely no room for our own good works when it comes to our salvation. We are saved not by good works, we are saved unto good works, in Christ Jesus. That's our purpose, is to serve Jesus. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we do his good works as we allow him to work his purpose through us. You see, we don't earn favor with God. When God creates his masterpieces, he creates us in Christ Jesus so that we can do good, his works, his purpose through Christ. You see, no piece of art is capable of its own doing any good. But in the hands of its creator, it is able to accomplish the purpose 
for which it was created. And the same thing is true of you and me. Men, dads, grandpas, uncles, brothers, on our own, we are incapable of doing anything that's truly good. But in the hands of God who created us as his masterpieces, we can now fulfill the purpose for which we have been created. You see, they are God's works, not ours. Paul describes these good works as those which God prepared in, in advance for us to do. As God's masterpieces, oh, this is cool. He doesn't ask us to figure out what good works we want to do and then do them. Uh-uh. Instead, he merely uses us as conduits through which he accomplishes his own good works. Doesn't that take the pressure off, man? Doesn't that make life? <sighs> Thank you, Lord. Secondly, these good works are a lifestyle. We're literally to walk or to live in these good works, not merely to do them. I think it's an important distinction. Why? Because to walk or to live in good works indicates that it's to be a lifestyle, not just a to-do list that we check off each day and each moment that we figure, okay, oh, I picked the kids up after soccer practice. I went to Bible study. I put my two by, two, my loony into the offering plate today. No. What exactly are these good works that God has prepared for us to make? It's a lifestyle. And what is this lifestyle? And I think that's the question that Paul answers in the second half of the book of Ephesians. So let's take a quick peek ahead to the first book, for, for, to the first verse of that chapter. Listen to what Paul writes. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 1. This verse is a transition from the first three chapters of Ephesians, which contain basic doctrine. And he transitions to the last three ch uh, chapters, which describe how we're going to put that doctrine into practice on a day-to-day -day basis in our home with the relationship with our, with our wife, with our kids, at work, with those that we work with and work for. Or to put it into Paul's language, the last three chapters are those good works that God has prov provided for us to live in. So good works includes things like unity within the body, treating my wife as my equal partner, with respect, treating my kids, leading my kids, treating those and serving those that I work with and work for is changing the way that we think and treat others. Husbands loving their wives, wives respecting their husbands, children honoring their parents, parents training their children to love, to serve God, to being good, to being good employees, and to being good uh, employers with integrity, to putting on the armor of God. Those are all the good works that God has purposed for His children, for you, Dad, for you, son, for you, brother, for every man watching today on Father's Day, not just once a year. He calls us to walk in these good works that he's created. Every believer as his masterpiece, say it with me again. I am God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do those works he's prepared for me to do. But God doesn't just stop there. But he gives us the power to do it. The power of God's masterpiece. He doesn't, Paul doesn't directly address this, 
But he reminds us in, in chapter five, verse in verse 18 to 20, that to be filled with the spirit, not with wine, where is an excess, but be filled with the spirit. That word filled means to be continually filled. As we submit to him, we are filled with his spirit, enabling us with the power to live what he's called us to live. Say it with me again. I am God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do those good works he's prepared in advance for me to do. You see, we can't do it on our own. Can't do it on our own strength. Just like salvation, the Bible says we were dead in sin. Satan had us by the throat. We could do nothing to save ourselves. Everything we did was as filthy rags. But now that we are in Christ, we are a new creation. He's indwelled and filled us with his spirit, giving us his power, making us capable to live the lifestyle by which he's prepared for us to live. He's made us his masterpiece. And when he makes us into his masterpiece, one of the benefits is that he gives us the power we need to be able to live the kind of life that Paul writes about. Paul describes that same power in his letter to the Philippians. Got your Bible open? Look it up. Philippians. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. The reason that we're able to do the good works that God has prepared is that he is at work in our lives. Isn't that comforting? Shouldn't that take the burden off your shoulder? Not only does he give us both the desire to do good works, he gives us the power to carry it out. The Bible is clear, man, that we are saved by faith alone, but we're not saved by a faith that is alone. We are God's masterpiece, created by him for the purpose of doing good works. And it is God who both determines what those works are will be, and it's God who gives us the power to live that kind of life, day by day, week by week, year by year. Say it with me again. I am God's masterpiece. Myra Brooks Welch wrote a beautiful poem a number of years ago, Touch of the Master's Hand. Let me read it. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought hardly worth his while. To waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. "'What am I bid, good people?' he, he cried. "'Who starts the bidding for me?' One dollar, one dollar, do I hear two, two dollars? Who makes it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray bearded man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the strings, he played a melody, pure and sweet, as sweet as the angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid? For this old violin and he held it aloft with its bow. One thousand? One thousand? Do I hear two? Two thousand? 
Who all makes it three? Three thousand. Three thousand once. Three thousand twice. Going and gone, said he. The audience, they cheered. But some, they cried. We just don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, all battered and bruised, with hardship is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine. He travels on. He is going once. He is going twice. He is going and almost gone. But the master comes. And the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Say it with me one last time. I am God's masterpiece. I am created anew in Christ Jesus. I am created to do his works. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for every person, man, woman, and dad, and granddad, and uncle, and brother who has been listening today. And I pray, Lord, that your word would open up their hearts to receive this truth, that they are your masterpiece, not in their own strength, but because of Jesus Christ. Father, if there are any that do not as yet know you, they've been striving, they've been working hard, may they now rest as they yield their hearts and lives to you and as they pray and pray with me from your heart, Lord Jesus, I have been striving and failed. I am a sinner. I confess myself, my sin to you and I ask your forgiveness. I trust in you as my Savior, my Lord, and my God. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Fill me with your Spirit. And help me to live for you forever. Amen. God bless. Thanks for tuning in today. And we'll see you again next time. Thank you for being with us, and we trust that today's message has indeed been an encouragement to you. Again, if you would like more information for our church, you can connect with us at hcfsydney.ca. We believe that growth happens in community, and if you live in the Sydney or Peninsula area, or maybe you're visiting, we would love the opportunity to meet you in person. Our church is located at 10364 McDonald Park Road in Sydney. We're right in between the airport and the highway. We look forward to you being with us every Sunday at 1030. God bless and have a wonderful week.
Thank you.